America's Cannabis Conversation. Heard every Saturday at 4.20 p.m. online at americascannabisconversation.com. We're part of the W420 Radio Network, and each week we provide you with information, education, and insight into the exploding medical and recreational cannabis industry. You'll hear from industry leaders, elected officials, local experts, detractors, and more. Learn how to build your own cannabis business, how to grow the product, what's legal, and where it's legal. Tune in each week to hear updates from the National Cannabis Industry Association in Washington. Tips on investing in cannabis markets, personal success stories, and more. It's now time to join America's Cannabis Conversation. Here's 420 Lifestyle Correspondent Rich Walkoff. Well, there's so many components in the cannabis industry, but one of the more mercurial would be mechanically pre-rolled joints the world's leading pre-roll producer and uh, technology guru is dean arbit the ceo bud.com and the ceo of wagner dimas am i pronouncing that correctly sir you are up thank you (laughs) beautiful pre-roll joints i mean you're taking the art out of it but now it's technology or mechanism over the human artisan influence so yeah, we, we call it frictionless uptake, my friend. <laughs> so basically, when you're ready to, to, to smoke, we don't want anything standing in your way. Uh, in all seriousness, uh, frankly, it's, uh, it's, it's happened with every, as every industry matures. We're just helping sort of productize the industry. Okay, but you have hundreds of clients. You have millions upon millions of pre-rolls, which is now becoming an art form in and of itself. Uh, it is. So uh, right now, the, the the tendency in the industry as it gets bigger is you're getting more specialization and uh, our company just has a better mousetrap. And so we're well positioned to work with the other bigger brands on their pre-rolls. They understand that um, uh, essentially, you know, uh, we've got a more efficient uh, way to do it. Uh, we've got a lot more throughput that we can offer them, and so uh, we're partnering with a lot of the strong brands, letting them do what they do, and that's generate demand or grow really good weed. Leave it to us to uh, to roll it up. We're good at it. All right, how did this start? How the heck did you get into mechanical, you know, machine roll joints? Uh, I I I I've smoked a lot of joints. But um, and I, hopefully you've rolled a lot of joints. Rolled quite a few, not as many as my partner uh, um, Mitchell Wagner. So Mitchell is the uh, the engineer and the brain behind um, behind our platform. Uh, he started building this by breaking every tobacco uh, machine that existed. Um, it took him about three and a half years to come up with what's essentially a strikingly different. Uh, mechanism than you'll see um, right now anywhere else in cannabis or in the tobacco sort of rolling spaces. So uh, he came up with it, uh, took him about three and a half years, uh, invested every penny he had. We met, um, he was almost there, I invested the last money uh, and then got in some more investment, uh, got in about a million bucks. We built the machine and that first year we made ten million dollars. Crazy, I mean thousand percent in your first year so i guess when you roll a cigarette tobacco doesn't have the same stickiness or challenges that it is when you roll cannabis joints absolutely which is why you don't see uh rob you don't see the uh those same formats in cannabis right you don't see the cigarette style joints there's some folks years ago that tried and they failed miserably. We don't think that um, that the cannabis consumer wants any part of that format. It's associated with, with cigarettes, very different ethos. Um, also just the format as far as having uh, an acetate filter, it just goes against, uh, I think, what cannabis smokers like. Um, and I think it goes uh, very counter to um, smoking a good tasting product if that filter is essentially blocking the taste it defeats a purpose for most folks okay how is your filter different so uh we've made a a format that works without filters or with filters our format makes everything between a 0.25 
uh, gram joint, which uh, is referred to as a dog walker, all the way up to a three and a half gram joint that we've uh, mechanized now uh, and making uh, uh, in large volumes for Tommy Chong. So uh, we had to look at the constraints of this industry. It's very different. You need a lot more than one format, and we just built something very different that works. Yeah, so it's not so much the filter. It's, it's the product and the processing. So what is unique to your pre-rolls that make it so exceptional? How many hundreds of different... Uh, growers and cultivators, distributors are using yours? So we, uh, we've we made uh, over 500 SKUs. Um, right now we've got probably 60 uh, co-packing partners, uh, you know, really big brands that everyone's heard of, uh, celebrity brands included. And right now I think we uh, are producing six out of the top 11 uh, best-selling joints in the state. Right you now. can name drop, it's okay. Well, we, we, I'd rather not because at this point we have, uh, we do have relationships that we, uh, that we do, uh, care about and some of our, uh, some of our partners would rather the information, uh, not be out there, but I'll, I'll give you a few just cause you're a San Francisco guy and I like you. <laughs> uh, so we, we roll the joints for, uh, Cypress Hill and for, uh, Tommy Chong. Uh, we roll the joints for, uh. Uh, Mind Your Head, which is Mickey Hart's brand that he just dropped from the Drake Grateful Dead, uh, and then uh, a ton of really great uh, endemic brands, essentially cultivators that grow really fire weed that we help productize their products. So I guess reading the subtext, people don't want to know that their their brand is being rolled by some other company. They want to keep it kind of proprietary or... Privately so, is, is that the essence of it? I think it just doesn't, it, there's not a huge benefit to us uh, because we have no no issues right now finding mm-hmm. clients. We've got a, a list of folks waiting. And so for us, we'd rather uh, sort of give the glory to our brand partners. They're out there uh, putting their best foot forward, doing a ton to support those brands. Uh, we're just sort of trusted production partners and we'd like to stay in the background. Okay, that's cool. So what about the processing of the weed to make the joint roll and smoke as well as it does you don't want the popping you don't want any uh any obstacles in your smoking experience another great question looks like you've had a couple obstacles in your smoking experience and you're very just once or twice there you go just (laughs) once or twice so uh again it's a great question and we look at this uh very differently than just having built a machine that rolls joints um we have built a platform that starts at the grind. Um, The grind is where uh, you lose all the terpenes and moisture the minute that it basically, uh, the flower goes in. Um, Basically all the nose goes up in the air if you don't account for for preserving those terpenes and that taste. So what we did was uh, we worked with, um, with great genetics providers and analytical labs three years ago and we tested uh, every part of um, essentially we tested every type of uh, grinding mechanism that was prevalent at the time Um, we found that one of those worked a lot better to mitigate terpene loss we then adjusted that to further uh, sort of modify it for our purpose Uh, we've done that at every stage of the step uh, because the biggest enemy of a pre-roll is lack of taste and flavor. That's got nothing to do with just making the joint. It has everything to do with grinding it, making it efficiently, and then overwrapping it that same day, which is something that we stand by. Um, our system, another very unique part of our system, um, is the fact that we we have a very different technology. It's not a vibratory table uh, like these knock boxes or the other vibratory systems. Um, our system actually um, accounts. We have a different method um, of, uh, of of getting the weed in the joint, essentially a different method of compressing. And so um, we're able to actually fill down by the crutch where generally it's hard for those joints that are made by knock boxes. Uh, it's hard for that weed just on gravity alone to sort of matriculate all the way down by the crutch so that you have a nice, even, firm joint. You don't get that either boating or you don't get the 
kind of that uh, the gap uh, right at the crutch. Um, so our tech accounts for that. Okay, for the the non aficionado, you're you're throwing out some vernacular that may not be uh, known by everybody. Knock boxes and the crutch. Okay, so the crutch is the lower part uh, instead of the filter. There is no filter on on joints. Uh, it's generally a crutch that you see at the end, which is the little cardboard part um, that you suck on to get the weed out, right? Um, knock box is great question. Um, knock boxes are the most prevalent sort of off-the-shelf tool that were really made for low-volume pre-roll uh, manufacturing. Uh, it's made by Futurola. You make about 100 joints at a time. Uh, now, you're talking... You're, you're making joints in the millions. How many joints are you producing with your machines, and where is this done? Uh, so our factory for uh, cannabis processing is in Oakland, uh, and we run uh, two to 250,000 joints a day out of Oakland. Um, we also have a, uh, a hemp facility that, um, that we moved into uh, just last month, and that's part of a partnership uh, with a big hemp ag group. So we're rolling, we've adopted our technology from cannabis to hemp. So we're rolling hemp pre-rolls or hemp cigarettes uh, at a facility out of Moss Landing right by Santa Cruz, California. Now I heard about the hemp joint ventures. That's a fascinating uh, new endeavor because if you're trying to take cigarette smokers aw away from tobacco, this is a potentially wonderful alternative. It is, um, and we think there are a lot of folks that uh, don't want to be inebriated, um, especially at different times during the day. Um, so they're essentially social smokers um, that have been asking for a product that tastes good, uh, that they can try instead of cigarettes. And then there's also a faction of tobacco smokers um, looking to nicotine-free smokes for cessation. Um, we see uptake very quickly. Uh, we've launched a product called Level Hemp, um, where we use uh, uh, we use all hemp paper. We've also crafted a filter made from hemp pulp as opposed to acetate used in cigarettes. Uh, we've also uh, that filter has its own pressure draw, which essentially means it allows for more airflow, so you can taste the really good tasting weed that has no THC in it. Um, so it's a really unique experience. The product is cool. It's all natural, all biodegradable. Um, and we think it provides uh, a pretty cool option for folks trying to get off cigarettes and those that just want a good tasting smoke that don't want to get high. That is that is amazing. I mean, I remember the, the rage a few years ago about spirit cigarettes, the all natural cigarette, which was tobacco that was not processed the same way. It didn't have any uh, you know, chemical additives and the like. But it still was nicotine, and it still was the danger of smoking tobacco. Is there any research to indicate that the smoking of hemp is uh, more favorable? One would think it would be, but have you uh, looked into that much? So there's no research right now that shows uh, that smoking uh, CBD uh, or anything else is uh, can be said to be you know beneficial to one's health. I'll say that. Would have a detriment. And we and we would not and we would also not uh, ever market the product that way. However, um, I can tell you that uh, there is no right now. There, there's no data out there saying that CBD um, or frankly even THC is addictive. Whereas everybody understands uh, that that's that's the biggest problem with uh, it's, it's not tobacco. It's it's nicotine, and so it's nicotine is is what's being delivered there. Um, so. Um, getting off nicotine is, is the goal, and uh, CBD is, uh, at this point, is uh, absolutely not known to be uh, an addictive substance. Yeah, so it's a win-win. Well, five million pre-roll joints from your company. You're the world's leading machine-rolled joint company in the world. Uh, that's just phenomenal. And has, has the growth been exponential? I mean, you're still escalating? Uh, we are. Uh, lots of work to be done. Um, we chose, uh, like I just mentioned, we really chose to pivot uh, with the opportunity in hemp instead of uh, going full bore 
and uh, growing uh, in other states and cannabis, as you know, um, regulations make it real tough. You got to go out there and essentially set up shop in every state. And uh, even though we had deals uh, to do uh, to, to essentially go into every state, um, we chose to um, point our resources to hemp because we think it's a much bigger, uh, more addressable market. And uh, we like the idea of doing it from one factory in Moss Landing and being able to export all over the world. Cool. People want to contact you or learn more about your company? DeanAtBud.com. Easy. Easy peasy. Yeah, man. Dean Harbit, the CEO of Wagner Dumas and Bud.com. Thanks so much for joining us. Rich Walcoff for the W420 Radio Network. W420RadioNetwork.com. When winter comes or the clouds or night comes, indoor farms turn to artificial light to make their crops grow. Let's say hello to an expert, Joe Sullivan from Franklin Energy. He is the Indoor Agricultural Program Manager. Everybody knows that indoor grow is more challenging, and then again, it can be more advantageous because you can control uh, the ecosystem and your environment. A word for indoor ag or indoor growing would also be uh, controlled environment agriculture. And, you know, that's exactly what you're trying to do. You're trying to control and provide the best possible environment. Far and away, LED is the best source to provide light for plants to grow. They're more energy efficient. They use less wattage and they provide the same amount, if not better light than high pressure sodium, metal halide and other traditional light sources. They're a, more of a broad spectrum light source, so they're providing light within the photosynthetic active radiation wavelengths really more broadly than your traditional light sources. They last longer, and they're traditionally more reliable than high-pressure sodium, metal halide, and you know those types of light sources. I understand it can reduce grow time up to 30%. They can last up to 50,000 hours. They are more durable than fluorescent, and they emit less heat. It's like a no-brainer. And I understand that Franklin Energy is giving consumers an opportunity to capitalize on LEDs if they want to upgrade their lighting system. So tell us what's going on. Franklin Energy runs and implements rebate programs for utilities all across the country. If I have an indoor grow and I want to make a transition to LEDs and I want to get that Franklin Energy rebate, tell us what we've got to do. You can contact the Excel Indoor Ag Program at excelenergy.com. That's X-E-L-Energy.com. And then from there, you navigate up top to business customers and then select rebates from the dropdown. And finally, you can select business lighting from there. My email address is jsullivan at franklinenergy.com. Telephone number is 720-822-3719. One of our amazing cultivation energy advisors will help you get started along your journey to be more efficient. Joe Sullivan from Franklin Energy, the Indoor Agricultural Program Manager. Thanks so much, Joe. This is Rich Walkoff on America's Cannabis Conversation. It's time for Women in Cannabis on America's Cannabis Conversation, part of the W420 Radio Network. Didn't you get the memo? Here's Chase Roberts. Welcome back to the conversation. This is Chase Roberts, Women in Cannabis correspondent for the W420 Radio Network. It's a pleasure to introduce Roz McCarthy, founder and CEO of Minorities for Medical Marijuana. She is also the Chief Executive Officer of Black Buddha Cannabis. Roz has also been recognized by High Times Magazine as one of the top 100 influential people in cannabis for 2017, and her organization has been recognized in 2018 and 2019 with Cannabis Industry Organization of the Year Awards. Roz, welcome. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Of course. I wanted to start at the beginning. Um, Roz, where are you from and where did you go to school? Where, what's your upbringing? <laughs> so I'm from um, a little town in Florida called Oviedo. Um, it's a kind of a, 
you know, it's a, a little country town outside of Orlando, Florida. Um, I'm an only child. I grew up an only child and um, just had a normal childhood upbringing. Um, I went to Florida State University uh, for my post-secondary um, education. And um, literally my background has been after graduating um, in healthcare um management, healthcare marketing, business development. I spent some time um, working um, in recruiting nurses. I also spent some time working in the pharma industry for about 10 years with Bristol Myers Squibb. And I spent some time as a regional director and a senior marketing director for um, a VITAS Hospice, which is the largest hospice organization or largest hospice company in the country. And um, that was a really unique opportunity in a position um, to learn more on the clinical side about end of life care and supporting individuals who are dealing with um, life medical conditions that are, are challenging. And so, um, yeah, it's just, it's been a whirlwind. It's always been about healthcare, med, um, creating opportunities for health um, equity, which I, I think is really, so yeah. I, I feel like looking at your history, which is very um, impressive. And I feel like it's all kind of led up to where you are now in sure. the cannabis industry. I mean, did you ever imagine when you were younger that this would be <laughs> where you're at right now? I will put a big capital in <laughs> ever. ever. Yeah. In my, I mean, Listen, I'm going to tell you something in life. We're put in positions that, you know, we have no idea what our life path is going to be. Um, when you're young, you're just thinking, you know, I was thinking corporate America. I'm going to advance. I'm going to never in my wildest dreams that I think I would become an entrepreneur. Never thought I would be in a position of being uh, of being an advocate because I am really advocate first before everything. Yes. And never thought it was going to be for an industry like cannabis. Um, growing up, we were always told that it's, you know, it's a gateway drug. You know, this is the devil's lettuce. Like, yeah. go to bed. like, you don't touch this. You don't smell it. You don't nothing. You know, even when I was in college, I was really the only person in my friend group that didn't consume. Like, I didn't smoke. Like, and I hadn't even, you know, after graduating and, you know, getting married. I mean, I just, just never did. I always thought it was like, not a good look. It was bad. It smelled, you know, never yeah. understand the the medical and the wellness properties of this plant. So never, ever did I think well, let's this. Let's get into that because you are the founder and CEO of Minorities for Medical Marijuana, which I mentioned earlier, which was started in 2016. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about this? What was the impetus to start it? Um, I would like to also go into some of your national programs you offer, mm -hmm. but maybe just what is your mission there and how many members and yeah. So I started in for MM um, literally while sitting on my sofa. There was a commercial that came on. It was, uh, no, it wasn't. It was actually, I was watching the news and the commentator was talking about the state of Florida was going to have the, uh, the uh, amendment to on the ballot for the medical marijuana program for the state of Florida. Now, those who, don't, who do not know, and those that, you know, you know, um, from a political standpoint, you know, when you see Florida, we are always either we are that 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 we're that state that kind of either it tells you exactly how the maybe how the election is going to go. We really have a strong um, connection okay. to driving or leading the way when it comes to things that are, you know, just new, innovative, political, you name it. You know, Florida is a very diverse state. And so for me, um, the fact that Florida was even considering um, it, it was going to be on the ballot and it was, you know, again, people were, you know, they were um, actually. Uh, stating that they thought that it was going to pass overwhelmingly, and it did, um, almost 75% uh, of the people voted yes for it, or 67% rather. Um, so long story short, I just start thinking about what does this mean for my community? Mm -hmm. What does, does this really mean? Like, I want to do research on it. And so I went through my phone and I sat on my sofa and I Googled cannabis, cannabis as medicine, cannabis for this, cannabis for cancer, cannabis for... For sickle cell, I just, I, I looked at California. I called my girlfriend who was out in California and she was in the industry. And so she really gave me a lot of education. 
And it was there that I was like, you know what? I want to start an organization that's focused on communities of color, people of color, allow, um, connecting us to this industry um, from, an economical, from an economic standpoint, as well as from a health equity, public policy, and social justice. And I literally, you know, started, I went on my computer, I, I Googled looking for organizations because um, I didn't know what name I want to name it. And then, you know, my marketing side of me said, you know, Roz, name it for what it is. What are, who's the community? Who, who are you trying to attract to your brand? And why is it important? And that's where I came up with Minorities for Medical Marijuana. Um, I literally, my mom passed away from breast cancer in 2005. I'm sorry. Cancer, I yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Um, her quality of life at the last six to nine months of, of life was poor, to say the least. And cannabis could have helped her most definitely. And then at the time when I was, you know, again, working through the process and thinking, okay, I'm going to do this. I have a 17 year old son who's at home with me and my son has sickle cell anemia. For those who don't know about sickle cell is predominantly found in the African-American community. It's a genetic disease. It's very, very painful. It's basically, um, it's the red, the red blood cells in your body are deformed and they don't produce round, nice, circle um, shaped blood cells that will then, you know, um, that will then transport oxygen to all the parts of your body. When you have sickle cell anemia, your um, red blood cells look more like a crescent moon shape. They're very sticky. They're very tacky. They end up getting stuck between your joints and they cause extreme pain. Um, they have a hard time getting oxygen to all the important parts of your body. Um, there's individuals that get lots of transfusion. They're on lots of opioids for pain management. And, you know, my son is a sickle cell patient. We have, I'm a sickle cell mom. I have been taking care of him and his uh, medical condition all of his life. And so I didn't want people to look at my son, if he ever wanted to use medical marijuana as an option, as being, you know, some of the negative stigma that around um, Black men in particular, like, you know, lazy, don't want to work if they consume or, you know, yeah. not productive, just negative stuff that's out there that wasn't really true. And that isn't really true. The stereotypes that shouldn't exist, basically. That should not exist. Exactly. I'm sure you've discovered that the cannabis industry, unfortunately, also uh, mirrors real life in the sense that in this particular industry, it's traditionally, you know, white men, uh, you know, of upper class with the CEO positions and things like that. And that's why the social equity, which you guys represent is so incredibly important. So Roz, as you know, the cannabis industry mirrors every other industry that's out there. And sure. traditionally you will find the CEOs and the founders tend to be the privileged 1%. And that's why it's so important that there is social equity in this new booming industry as well. Can you tell me some of the things that you guys offer for um, minorities and the masses that are just trying to get everyone on a level playing field? Absolutely. I mean, you really nailed it. You nailed it so well because this industry is no, no better, no bigger. I mean, I shouldn't say no bigger, but this, the challenges that we see in other industries like technology, um, like banking, like finance, um, you know, where we're seeing workforce to, on the workforce side that we're not seeing an adequate representation of, of diverse individuals on the ownership side or the business ownership side, we're not seeing uh, enough representation. The same thing is happening with cannabis. However, we have an opportunity. We already know what the problem is. We have already identified it. Yeah. We diagnosed it. We know what the issue is, right? We know that one, we have an industry that has a lot of barriers that make it very hard, not only for social equity, because social equity is one kind of like kind of lane, right? Right. That's social equity is defined, guys. So those who are listening, social equity in my estimation is defined as individuals who have been harmed by the war on drugs. They were either incarcerated or they lived in a disproportionately impacted community that was targeted for cannabis related type of arrest and incarceration. Absolutely. Things like um, search, like search and sniff, targeted type of um, complicit um, things that happened in those communities, which literally put them behind, that arrested, that created other um, issues where you were um, socially held back. Um, economically held back, that's social equity, right? Yeah. 
And it created legacy problems. That kind of specific unjust targeting then created legacy problems. Right, which people are still dealing with today, right? Yeah, so, I was so going to ask you about the expunging of records. I know you guys work hand in hand with Project Clean Slate. Yes, that's that's our program, projectcleanslate.org, for those that are listening. Um, that is our expungement program that it, we've partnered with Hawthorne Social Justice Fund. Um, Hawthorne has come on board and supported our efforts to go um, into cities where we can be, make an impact. We do expungement education. We do expungement clinics. We're excited. We're we're getting ready That's to amazing. Change. Yeah, we're we're about to embark on a webinar series. It's entitled it's entitled Healing Our Communities with Paulette Simone. Um, she's a mental health therapist, and she's going to be doing quarterly webinars specifically for individuals who have been impacted, who have been incarcerated, arrested about the mental health support mental health resources, being able to understand, like we take for granted and we kind of sometimes in the industry, we're like, oh yeah, I'll do this. Let's do an expungement clinic. And we walk away and we don't realize we're dealing with people and people need to feel that they, they need resources. They need connectivity. Yeah. And, and so one part about our program is not just about going and doing expungement clinics, but how do we serve the holistic person? How do we support the holistic person with resources where even if we're not talking to them, they can go to our Project Clean Slate web, um, website and be able to pick out resources or information or send us a comment and asking for support if they're going through you know, a tough time. So um, it's, it's really a program that um, literally we started it last year. Um, it just, it was fantastic, phenomenal, the type of support and the efforts and the outcomes that we have last year. Um, this year, we're looking to also work with small and mid-level cities, um, these mayors in these cities, and really um, educate them on doing some automatic expungement and really challenging them to look at their municipality and look at how many people that have been targeted and look at like these ticky tack cases. I'm not talking about, you know, you know, convictions with a felony or conviction no, with- We're talking about, uh, yeah. I'm talking Virgin about that should have been dropped as soon as it became legal. Yes, yes. Picky tacky little things that could be yeah. dropped. It's, you know, just imagine if you're out there and you're looking for a job and you had something on your record from 20 years ago and it was a little ticky tacky thing. Well, however, that ticky tacky, um, tr um, you know, conviction or record, um, it actually stopped you or prevented you from getting that job or made, you know, made a situation from a housing perspective even more difficult if you were trying to get housing. Um, these are type things that if we can erase it, if we could clear it off and then be able to give people a second chance at having, you know, um, you know, opportunities afforded to them. Um, that's what it's all about. Yeah. And so important, like I said, the targeting then goes on to create legacy problems that can never really be cleaned up, sure. which should have never happened originally. Exactly. So, yeah. So going back to your, you know, your point was I was explaining about social equity in that, that lane, but also the industry is you have the diversity and inclusion part, which is a different lane where you're ended up looking at how do we make sure that our industry is diverse. How do we make sure it's inclusive? And so that's the whole premise behind Minorities for Medical Marijuana. We wanted to focus on four different core areas, health equity, access to the plant from a medical perspective. Let's, let's knock out these stigma, lock out the negative crap that's going on in our community about this plant. Let's, let's learn, let's get educated, and let's make sure that people that are dealing with medical conditions who could benefit from cannabis get the resources and the education needed. The second thing is social equity, social economics. How do we, M for MM, and our, our state directors and our team and our extended family and supporters, how can we go pour into communities with information, resources, education about how to get into the industry? Different points of entry. It doesn't always have to be an operator touching plant. How do we talk about that? Third is the social justice with the expungement clinics with Project Clean Slate. And fourth, and, and not least, is public policy. We have a tremendous director of public policy with the organization. His name is Eric Foster. And the focus is so important for us to make sure that we are a part of the conversation at the early start of legalization, state by state, as well as federally. You cannot, if you're not, I, I, I'll put it to you like this. If you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And we <laughs> have to be at the table, right? 
I love we that. Have, we have we have to talk policy. We have to we have to educate our lawmakers who are responsible for writing policy. And that's the whole reason why public policy with M for MM is such a huge priority. You know what, Roz, I knew this was going to happen. There's so much to talk about and I can't <laughs> even believe our time is up. But please, um, we didn't even get into your other business. I would really love to have you back on and have Absolutely. another conversation if that interests you, because there is so much to discuss. We did not get to um, Black Buddha Cannabis. Can you please tell the, our the, listeners? The story, yes, the story the of web- Black Buddha Cannabis is one that I definitely want to tell you guys, because I'm going to tell you, I'll say this. The power of this plant is just, it's incredible. And I can't wait to tell you that story and how Black Buddha Cannabis was born. But to reach out to me at m for mm um, it's m for mm United. So that's M as in Mary, the number four, M as in Mary, M as in Mary, united.org. Um, you can call us 877-900-0832. We are like, literally, we have 27 states that we represent right now, three international um, countries and two historically black colleges and universities. That's a part of our um, our chapters. Um, and we're here and whatever we can do to help support, partner, educate, um, build bridges, um, you know, we're open. So important. And and. Can you please tell the listeners the website for Black Buddha Cannabis? Absolutely. Um, so the website for Black Buddha Cannabis is Black Buddha Cannabis, and the Buddha is spelled B-U-D-D-H-A. So Black Buddha Cannabis dot co, C-O, no M, just C-O. Got it. Rod, thank you for being here. If you missed any of this great interview with Roz McCarthy, you can go to W420 Radio Network and click on the archive section to listen to this and other great interviews. And we'll be right back. America's newest and fastest growing cannabis focused radio network is expanding across the country and looking to add to our sales and marketing team. America's Cannabis Conversation offers listeners insight and information on the exploding world of cannabis. It also gives advertisers the opportunity to reach a hyper-targeted audience, literally neighborhood by neighborhood, in markets all across the country. We're looking for a few motivated individuals that want to essentially run their own local business. To learn more about this exciting opportunity or to apply, visit americascannabisconversation.com. Sun is the source of all our living things, but when winter comes or the clouds come or night comes, indoor farms turn to artificial light to make their crops grow. We're talking with Joe Sullivan from Franklin Energy. He's the indoor agricultural program manager. We're getting a, a lighting 101 from you, Joe. I'm learning so much. The business energy assessment that you provide to growers, no cost. Tell me more. It's a great program through Excel Energy. We have a team here in Colorado that collectively has over 20 years of experience in the cannabis industry, in the controlled environment ag industry. Excel has hired Franklin Energy to really give growers free advice on how to save energy. So we are free consultants. So we go into grow facilities and take PPFD, light intensity measurements. Uh, We measure VPD for growers. We take all environmental measurements, and then we go ahead and provide growers with a report that has recommendations for not only uh, energy savings, but also optimizing growers' environment so they can increase yield and whatnot. So, um, again, that's completely free. Excel Energy pays the bill for growers' free consultants. And typically it takes a couple hours, we're in and we're out. And then, you know, we give you that that really good report that is going to provide recommendations for how you can save money and uh, help out your bottom line. We look at all cultivation equipment within the facility. So like you said, HVAC, dehumidification, airflow and fans. We'll look at your control systems, right? And then we'll make recommendations, either how to tweak those systems to perform better now, or 
recommendations to potentially swap out that equipment for more efficient equipment. And on top of that, we will provide energy savings calculations for all those recommendations and estimated rebates for what you might receive by moving forward with those recommendations. On top of that, we're uh, available to really help growers and hold their hand through the entire process of an upgrade. If I have an indoor grow and I want to make a transition to LEDs and I want to get that Franklin Energy rebate, tell us what we've got to do. You can contact the Excel Indoor Ag Program at excelenergy.com. That's X-C-E-L-Energy.com. And then from there, you navigate up top to business customers and then select rebates from the drop-down. And finally, you can select business lighting from there. But to get information fast, my email address is jsullivan at franklinenergy.com. Telephone number is 720-822-3719. One of our amazing cultivation energy advisors will help you get started along your journey to be more efficient. And that's Joe Sullivan from Franklin Energy, the Indoor Agricultural Program Manager. He's a Jedi. Thanks so much, Joe. This is Rich Walkoff on America's Cannabis Conversation. Welcome back to America's Cannabis Conversation. I'm your host, David Tapsmeyer. And today we have the world of growing. Something to talk about because the field of growing is growing exponentially. We're making it up as we go along in the fastest expanding business that America has seen in a long time. So to find out a little bit about growing, we reached out to a abetterworld.net where Mitchell Rabin is host of A Better World Radio and TV and media promotions. And he said, if you want to know growing, you want to talk to Roman Kilgore of Buffalo Turf Growers, buffaloturfgrowers.com. So, Mitchell, thank you for coming on to the show, and thank you for inviting our special guest, Roman Kilgore. My pleasure, Dave. Absolutely great to be back again. Roman Kilgore is a good uh, friend of a uh, good friend of mine, uh, Ray Curzon, and uh, he introduced us some time ago into what is Roman's uh, primary activity now, and that's growing high-quality medical marijuana in the state glorious state of Oklahoma. He's doing a great job. He's one of the larger growers in the state, and he is very committed to high-quality, quality strains of medical marijuana, which is helping a lot of people. And so I've had the pleasure of getting to know Roman over the past period of time and his partners, and have always just admired his commitment to the space and in making a difference in people's lives as a result of making this uh, medical marijuana available to people across the state. So uh, I'd love for you, Roman, if you would, to pick up the thread and uh, talk to us a little bit about what you're doing on the ground there and the way your business is also growing along with the marijuana. Okay, yes, I uh, retired as a police officer and from Dallas, and I'd worked 33 years there, and I realized that I was still going to need to do something else. And so I had a good friend that was in the, the business when Oklahoma legalized the medical marijuana, and so I went up to check his place out. And he you know, kind of brought me in and just let me see everything and showed me the everything that was going on. And I thought, man, this is what I want to do because I, I'd realized that the war on drugs is specifically – with marijuana was a lost cause besides the fact that marijuana has more medical cures for people's ailments and things that they have, you know, that, that the regular um, food and drug type administration just, you know, kind of closed their eyes to. And so I just, my mom had gotten uh, esophageal cancer. And so I was on this big search trying to find things to help heal her. You know, and part of my research was with the marijuana field. And so I just really thought that that's what I need to be in to, you know, help people with whatever their issues are, whether it's epilepsy, seizures, uh, cancer, 
chronic pain, stress, anxiety, the whole nine yards, um, things that, that the the marijuana actually helps cure or fix or, you know, uh, sub- pain sub- subsides when they, they're on that. And I've seen how it reacts with people that have those issues, and it's very – a, a very good thing for them, unlike say uh, alcohol. Um, it's uh, I've see I've had more people that through my career I've dealt with more issues with people that have been drinking alcohol that they lose all their inability to really um, cognitively think through things because they don't have it. But people that are um, use cannabis is not anywhere like that. So. That kind of started me into that direction. Then my a good buddy, Tim Holland, he got me going, you know, in this business, and he became a consultant for me. And so once I decided to do this, I, uh, I, 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 there are certain um, parameters that you had to go through to, to get a license. And so one was to be an Oklahoma resident. So, I, you know, I moved to Oklahoma, got my residency up there. Then I applied for the license and, and got that. And, but then, for if you're going to do indoor good quality cannabis growing, it costs a lot of money. And so that was one of the the things that I was kind of going through. I was like, I'm, I mean, it's really expensive. So a lot of people think that oh, this is such a lucrative business. It is if you do everything just right. But I know a bunch of growers that are going out of business now because of various different reasons and it's i think people thought well we just you know go get a bunch of seeds throw them in the ground water them, and we're going to have <laughs> all this you know cannabis we're going to sell and make a ton of money but yeah. it's really not like that so it's not for the faint of heart it's like any business you got to pour everything you've got into it you know it's not a, a part-time job and so i had a real good friend of mine that that I said, hey, I'm thinking about doing this. And so he had a friend up in Oklahoma also that had a cannabis business. So he he took me up there, and and I said, well, I'm thinking about doing this. And he said, well, hey, he goes, "Um, you know, just let me know if you need any help. And I said, well, I need need to borrow some money because the banks won't loan money for this. And so I every every penny that, that I put into it, I actually had to borrow. So I raised all my own money, borrowed it. So, you know, I'm in, I am in debt, you know, hopefully to pay that down. But, you know, that's the price you pay when you go into a business that, you know, requires a lot of upstart money, especially in this industry if you're doing a good quality indoor grow. The building is not so much what costs a lot of money it's everything else lights are 750 dollars to a thousand a thousand you know 1500 a light and you you know we have 240 lights in our building so we've got a quarter of a million dollars in lights um uh, air conditioners you know 12 to 20 acs going it's just air what is the volume of your uh product Per month, as an it, You know, it varies because when we first started out, I wasn't, I didn't fully fund the whole project. And so what I did is I thought, well, since I didn't want to go into hot to where I had to give up my firstborn babies, yeah. um, I, you know, so I thought, well, I'm as I grow, I'm going to add more lights. And so as I, as we had a harvest, we would use the proceeds for that and add more lights or whatever it is we needed at the time typically it was lights beds uh, just different things for your grow Um, and you know because everything's expensive your electrical work isn't just running one you know uh, electrical outlet in there we've got you know 50 or 60 in each room it's you know the the electric was about 33,000 a room to put in. We had a, a catwalk that we have put in. Those were seventeen thousand a room. So you can see mm. how these costs yeah. add up. They mount up. In, in they mount our... up. On another yeah. occasion, yeah. we'll talk about how I can help you with some of those electrical costs through right. off-grid blue power based 
off-grid, uh, micro-grid types of technology right. because they're coming oh, that, yeah, to the great. foreground, Roman. So you right. don't have you to be the, under uh, the thumb of the local utilities. Right. Absolutely. And, and so we the have cost that you of starting this up, um, and that you had to, uh, you know, borrow uh, and from sources that you find on your own, Roman. Uh, because banks weren't lending for this. But interestingly enough, in the state of Oklahoma, uh, there are banks that will allow you to do banking for your company. Isn't that true? Correct. And that's so they won't thing. lend it, uh, but they'll accept and you can bank there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they might. You know, right. I, don't, I don't know if they would want to – you know, the, the problem with getting involved in uh, hard lending or, say, debt financing with a financial institution – they put a date when they want to start getting their payments, and then you have to do it. So if you have individual money, like say I just personal loans that I've gotten, there's no hard date when I have to start paying that back. There's an idea in my head if everything goes right, but you know sometimes you get thrown off track. When we first started going, man, we, you know, all my all my uh, acquaintances up there that that were in it said don't. Don't get your hopes up for your first harvest. You know, it's probably going to just crash and burn. Well, man, we came out of the gates blazing. We had our first wow. five harvests. We were we were in the 70, 80-pound range. And so we were we were doing really well. And then the sales also, the, the price per pound was a little higher at that time. And the price per pound has dropped a little bit. And it also has a cycle of, of highs and lows. And so typically from about December, the middle of December to coming into right, right now getting towards March, it starts coming out of its low because they have a ton of outdoor grow harvest from the fall that throws thousands of pounds of cannabis on the market that these dispensaries are picking up for a lot cheaper than they'd pay for the indoor top shelf flower and so Mm -hmm. that is kind of a bump to us and then there's a bunch of illegal um growing going on where there these chinese groups are coming in and they kind of gravitated you know whether it's new mexico to from california to new mexico now to oklahoma where they bounce around and then they have these task force that go around and they bust these guys and i'm not sure how that part of it because they're growing thousands of pounds and and if that and I'm not sure how they go about avoiding some of the uh, OMAs, the Oklahoma Medical Marijuana Association that 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 oversees Regulate. the whole thing. Yes, and so you know you brought something up. I don't mean to interrupt. I just want to add no or, or expand the conversation to something we discussed the other day, which I found really interesting, which has to do with the different qualities, the different strains of medical marijuana and something that some growers do, which is sort of the uh, down and dirty, fast and cheap growing, and what you're doing, which sounds like you're very, very attentive to making sure you're developing a quality strain for the uh, medical purposes it's intended for. Could you perhaps speak a bit about that? Yeah, so we, you know, people, there's a difference between different types of organic. You know, I years ago, I had a yeah. friend from California. He was a jiu-jitsu guy. He comes out, and he's wanting to go eat organic, and he says, hey, let's go eat some organic food. And I said, well, if this, this, I said, he, or he asked me, he goes, is this organic? And I said, yeah, they grow everything in the dirt. You know, I'm like, Man, you know, you're talking <laughs> with ticks, and, you know, I don't know, you know, organics growing in the dirt. It's like, no, no pesticides, yep. anything like that. And so we use a very high-grade um, nutrient line that is organic in itself, but it's mm-hmm. it's not where we're fermenting fruit and making our own organic mix with teas and things like that. And those are things we might get into one day, if, you know, if we do some uh, greenhouse grows. But we have a very high-end organic um, uh a nutrient line that we use and yes we so we use we don't use any type of pesticides everything's natural oils nematodes um different things to 
cure any problems if we have any type of bug issues? Because in Oklahoma, you do have bugs. Typically, you know, you could have mites, gnats, spider mites, uh, thrips, all different things. Little these little bugs can get in any anywhere. But it's a daily maintenance that you do a protocol you go through to keep that down to the bare minimum so you have a good quality product yeah. at the end. And so we try to run with really great strains that have a good testing profile. So your testing profile, when you after we grow our crops and we take 10 grams into the facility and they test these for microbials, heavy metals, and pesticides, are the main things they're really checking for. And so if you don't, if you sell any of those, you can't sell your product. And so ours yeah, have always yeah. tested right at zero, you know, because we have no no issues at all, but it's staying on top of it. And so that profile so you're effectively breaks down. organic in that way because if yes. you get through yep. the stringent testing, you're effectively organic. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. So it's a, you know, a THC profile, it has a big pie chart, and it, it gives you how much THC you produced, what, how much CBD in that strain, and then the turpin values. So the THC is more for the people's high or their pain compliance stuff, but the turpins kind of work synergistically and the CBD within all of that. So mm-hmm. the higher the ter- terpene value, really, the higher the medical um, value, the therapeutic uh, value. value, yes, is for you along with the CBD. So really, mm-hmm. people aren't too customers aren't too smart with with that part of it. They want it, They're looking for this thirty percent THC that you know. And I don't. I've never used it. I don't smoke it, so I wouldn't know per se. It's all my you know uh, medical patients that I talk to and things that use it. They. They say that the higher testing THC is more of a harsh smoke for them if they're doing it that way. But the the best is probably in the you know around in the low uh, you know high teens, low mid twenties with a high turpin value and a higher yes. CBD value. We sell primarily to dispensaries, and then we sell our shake and trim is what comes off of the bud. It's after you when you harvest this, you you cut off all the big fan leaves and water leaves, what we call them. It's that's what I used to thought everybody smoked back in the day when I was a cop. I thought that's what they smoked. It didn't. It's the actual bud seed. You don't want seeds in your flower. That's a that's a a, a male plant that those seeds came from. We grow feminized plants that have no seeds, and so the quality of the flower is much higher. How, based on all that you have experienced to date over these last several years that you've been in this uh, field, Roman, uh, what do you feel you are looking for in an investor? Is it simply someone with money? Is it someone who also has a real feel for the industry and for the, the medical benefit that comes to people when they are involved in this business that you're involved in? What, is there a profile that you kind of look for? Well, you know, in anything, you have investors that might come in or your own personal friends that typically most of the people that I'm engaged with aren't particularly too worried about making all the money. And and I'm mm-hmm. I mean, I want to I of course, I want to make all the money I can make, mm-hmm. but not to sacrifice uh, you know, quality of your product quality. or friendships or or you know, yeah getting off track with what is really important with life. But at the end of the day, you've got to pay your bills. And so this is a business. It is a commercial grow. It's about making money for myself and paying back, you know, the loans that that I have out. But part of those loans that I got were also, you know, I told them, hey, if it ever goes legal in, in Texas, you know, I will be right there and I'll I'll get you going. So I've been actually I've been consulting for several grows in Oklahoma where they've just hit hit roadblocks. Whether it's the quality of their flower that they're growing, they're they're not doing something right, or the sales 
asked also because no substitute for experience and also as you said roman there are a lot of things about growing that a lot of people just don't think about until they're in the industry uh you know how sensitive the lighting has to be uh your the cycles of your watering uh the nutrients of your soil and now you're talking about air pressure you carefully have analyzed and implemented all of these things and have skimped on none of the details so i can see why you're an advisor to other people in oklahoma i appreciate you giving us an insight that we can only get from somebody like you roman Thank you for coming on here, America's Cannabis Conversation. W420RadioNetwork.com.